Well, the program has just started, and so I'm going to take you to the University of Professional Studies, Accra, where the Faculty of Law is organizing a, a, a webinar, and it's featuring uh, Dr. Ibn Chambas. As you can see there, it's already started. Let's go there now. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen joining us. We're delighted at UPSD Law School to have the opportunity of hosting one of the most respected personalities of our country. The eminent guest lecture series provides a platform for leading personalities of our country and internationally to engage with the public on topical issues, particularly affecting our country, but also international. The platform is designed to provide an opportunity for uh, a sort of marketplace of ideas where we exchange um, ideas and a conversation around topical issues and subjects, and also provides an opportunity for the eminent personalities who are selected, carefully selected, to speak on the platform, to share the experiences of their lives as public servants, their terms in office, and the kinds of experiences that they have, particularly involving the subject for which they speak. Our speaker for today needs very little introduction, of which the moderator is going to do that shortly. But he is an international civil servant, he is an ex-politician of our country, and there's so much that can be said about him because he's well known. I'm confident that the subject for which he's going to speak on today, terror, regional security and elections, is an important one indeed, particularly as we approach elections on December 7th this year. Our country needs stability, and it's important that we have perspectives on how to ensure stability, given all that is happening in the Sahel region, with terrorism looming large um, just to the northern portion of Ghana. It's important that we share perspectives on these, and there's no better speaker to deliver on this today, in my opinion, than the eminent guest who is going to speak on this, Dr. Ibn Chambers. I'm therefore glad to welcome all of you to the platform. And I do hope that as he opens the maiden edition, the opportunity will be given for all of us to share perspectives on the topic and many more lectures will follow this in similar vein. So once again, thank you very much. And I welcome Your Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas to the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ernest Kofi Abochi, Dean of the Faculty of Law University of Professional Studies, Accra, UPSA. Now to our eminent guest, Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas is a special representative of the UN Secretary General and head of the United Nations Office for West Africa and the Sahel. Before this appointment, he was the African Union United Nations Joint Representative for Darfur and Head of the African Union United Nations Hybrid Operation in Darfur. From 2010 to 2012, Dr. Chambers was Secretary General of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific Group of States. He served as Executive Secretary of ECOWAS from 2002 to 2005, and later served as its president from 2006 to 2009. Back home in Ghana, Dr. Chambers was member of parliament for the Bimbela constituency from 1993 to 1996. He was deputy foreign secretary in 1987 and deputy minister for education 1999 to 2000. Dr. Chambers has a distinguished career as a consummate diplomat, international civil servant with impeccable service record. Dr. Chambers champions global peace in Africa. He's focused on peace, security, and good governance. Your Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambers, welcome to the eminent guest lecture series of the UPSA. I'm live. 
that he's frozen. You are live, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Professional Studies, Accra, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, other faculty uh, members, uh, the administration, dear students, uh, dear participants in today's platform, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very important and timely event, barely two weeks away from general elections in Ghana. Before I begin, let me take a moment for us to remember His Excellency Jerry John Rawlings, first president of the Fourth Republic. President Rawlings was one of our country's most illustrious leaders. He was often a voice for the voiceless in Ghana and Africa. Our greatest tribute to him at this moment will be to ensure that Ghana on 7 December continues the path of peaceful elections that he Im immensely contributed to establish by peacefully handing over power to His Excellency John Ajekum Kufo in the country's first ever transition of power. May he rest in peace. As regards today's lecture, I've been asked to share some reflections on the theme, terrorism, regional security, and elections in West Africa. I will attempt to do this by addressing three main issues. First, I will give a snapshot of terrorism and regional security in West Africa. Second, against that backdrop, I will address elections and challenges to democratic consolidation in the region. Finally, I will share some thoughts on the way forward. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, terrorism continues to undermine peace and security in West Africa. The last decade has been a distressing upward spiral in this regard. The Sahel region and the Lake Chad Basin area remain the areas most affected, even though terrorism knows no bounds. The pillars or the spillover effect of the conflicts in Mali and the Boko Haram affected areas are well known. Despite intense and sustained efforts by national governments, regional bodies, and international partners, terrorism persists. Security forces and civilians continue to be attacked. The impact on the humanitarian and human rights situation is devastating. Sexual violence is widespread and so is impunity. Terrorist assaults have also been accompanied by forced recruitment of children and abductions in Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Nigeria. A fragile security situation has prompted increased flows of internally displaced persons and refugees in the sub-region. According to UNHCR, as of August this year, over one million people have been forced to flee their homes in Burkina Faso. This is an increase of more than 90% compared to late 2019. In Mali, close to 270,000 270, people are internally displaced. Over 50% of them are women. 
In Niger, as of August, there are over 265,000 internally displaced persons. In addition, Niger hosts about 230,000 refugees in different parts of the country. In Nigeria, about 8 million people require emergency assistance. In Adamawa, Borno, and Yobe states, over 1.8 million people, more than half of them women, still live in closed shift camps or are hosted in communities that are themselves extremely vulnerable. National and multinational forces have scaled up counterterrorism operations. At the same time, many communities have mobilized on their own to create volunteer groups and self-defense militias. Human rights groups have raised concerns over alleged abuses by both self-defense militia and national security forces. In many places, terrorism, farmer herder conflicts, and intercommunal violence are increasingly interlinked. Alliances are formed for the sake of security and survival. Ethnicity and religion are instrumentalized, pitting one group against the other. The absence of the state in many peripheral areas creates opportunities for terrorists to advance their agenda. Populations are forced to concede in exchange for economic gains, protection, and social services. The Office of the Institute of Security Studies in Dakar, for example, has documented the multiple reasons for young people falling prey to terrorist groups in the Sahel. One common denominator is the absence of the state and the lack of income generating activities. The rise in terrorist activity and violent extremism in West Africa and the Sahel in the last decade has significantly altered people's trust in government. This trust must be restored for state institutions and the social contract between the state and citizens to be reinstated. Preventive measures must be both political and military in nature. Preventive measures must include long-term strategies for job creation and social provision of social services. They need to address the root causes that drive conflict and sensitize populations to the danger of terrorist groups. Indeed, good governance and a strong and present state are essential for democracy to take hold. On 16th November this year, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, from my, I'm turning now to democratic consolidation and elections, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation released its index of African governance covering the year 2019. As we all know, the index measures and monitors governance performance in 54 African countries annually. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation defines governance as providing the political, social, and economic public goods and services that every citizen has the right to expect from their state. Four governance categories are studies. And these categories are one, safety and rule of law. Two, participation and human rights. Three, sustainable economic development. And four, 
human development. This year, for the first time in a decade, the Mo Ibrahim Index of African Governance shows a decline in overall governance progress across Africa. While there were improvements in economic and human development in 2019, in some countries, rule of law and security have deteriorated in many countries. This is worrisome because rule of law and security, according to the foundation, are common denominators among best performing countries on governance. In more than half of the African countries surveyed by the foundation, citizens express increased dissatisfaction with governance delivery in their countries. For most countries, the deterioration in public perception of overall governance has even worsened since 2015. What does this mean for the prospect of democratic consolidation in West Africa? The Mo Ibrahim Foundation Index covered 2019. For 2020, the survey is not likely to improve given the COVID-19 pandemic and its negative impact on public health, human rights, people's livelihood, and economic growth. Distinguished participants, West Africa has seen important democratic progress since independence. Peaceful transitions from one elected government to another have taken place in a number of countries. During the period 2010-2015, many observers noted an upswing in democratic consolidation in the region. Empowered by social media, citizens began to increasingly speak up for democracy against repressive regimes associated with the past. Senegal's democratic alternation in 2012 was mainly people-driven, just like the 2014 popular revolt in Burkina Faso against the then president's attempt to prolong his term, as indeed was the case in the Gambia where sit tight dictator Yaya Jamit was ousted through the ballot by a determined population. A dynamic debate around presidential term limits was also taking hold. During the May 2015 summit of ECOWAS heads of state, they discussed a proposal to include term limits as part of the ECOWAS protocol relating to the mechanism for conflict prevention, management, resolution, and peacekeeping, and the supplementary protocol on democracy and good governance. Many heads of state at the time were favorable to term limits. Some argue an ECOWAS agreement on the issue would help restore public trust in democracy. Yet in 2015, the ECOWAS proposal to institutionalize and strengthen presidential term limits failed to garner sufficient support. Perhaps the time is right now to reconsider this proposal. Regarding elections in 2019, Fiercely contested presidential elections were organized in Nigeria, that was in February, in Senegal, also in February, and in Mauritania in June. In 2019, we also saw the opening of political dialogue between the ruling government and the opposition in countries such as Burkina Faso and Benin, while in Ghana, political stakeholders started a dialogue 
on vigilante groups. In Liberia, on 7 June, the government respected the people's right to peaceful protest and agreed to begin a dialogue on strengthening the economy and governance. Let me turn now to the year 2020, which has been an election year in West Africa. No less than six high stake presidential elections were scheduled for 2020, four of which have already taken place. Presidential elections were held in Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire last October, preceded by Togo in February. Presidential and parliamentary elections took place in Burkina Faso last Sunday, 22nd November, and Ghana is next on 7th December to be followed by Niger on 27th December. In Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire, we have witnessed two very contentious processes play out. There has been violence and loss of life. This is very deplorable. Many of the root causes that have been driving political tensions in both countries remain. Discord between the government and the opposition parties on the issue of a third term presidential mandate for the incumbents. Identity politics, long-standing grievances of political and economic exclusion, impunity, and a polarized population. It is critical that the dialogue that has been initiated by President Ouattara and former President Bédier should be productive and contribute to appeasing the situation in a durable manner. The United Nations and international community at large are conveying a similar message of a need for all inclusive dialogue and national reconciliation to Guinea, as the country is equally undergoing a tense post-elections moment. In Burkina Faso, insecurity has been a key factor of the electoral process. In late October, the Constitutional Court declared a state of force majeure for the 1,645 villages where the Electoral Commission had not been able to conduct registration or deploy. And this represents about 17% of the Burkinabe territory. It should be recalled that the National Assembly had to pass a, a vote on 25th August to modify the Electoral Code allowing for a validation of the polls, even if voting would not take place in some areas due to insecurity. To the credit of the political actors of Burkina Faso, it is worth mentioning that this vote in parliament was largely consensual. The consensual approach to solving election-related matters is part of the political landscape in Burkina Faso. It greatly helped to assuage the concerns of the opposition during the ongoing electoral process. ECOWAS, the African Union, La Francophonie, CENSAD, and civil society, both domestic and regional, have all concluded that the elections were by and large inclusive credible and peaceful. The United Nations commends all the Burkinabe stakeholders for the peaceful organization and conduct of their electoral process. And this encourages us to see this as a good model that could be emulated by other countries in the sub-region and far beyond. Let me also take a few minutes to speak to democratic consolidation in this country. 
Ghana has organized several peaceful and credible elections in the past three decades. This has earned the nation the enviable reputation as a bastion of democratic practice and orderly governance. Despite its imperfections, democratic elections have been accepted by Ghanaians as the best way of ensuring responsible leadership and development. I wish to reiterate that it is commendable that Ghana's democratic experiment is showing signs of positive evolution in which party manifestos and campaign messages have been largely policy-based, although there are still challenges with fringe elements within the major parties who often use intemperate language. The 7th December general elections in Ghana will be an opportunity to once again recount a success story of democratic participation. However, you will agree with me that no system is so good that it cannot be made better. Therefore, we must remain vigilant and address any challenges. Political vigilantism and hate speech represent a negative trend that needs to be turned around. We must also fight fake news and sensational reporting. All stakeholders have an important role in promoting social cohesion, respect for human rights, tolerance, peace, stability, and ultimately the development of the country. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, across the region, pre-electoral and post-electoral periods continue to be characterized by tension, antagonistic contests and disputes, including around non-consensual constitutional amendments. In some West Africa, in West Africa, elections are both a cornerstone of democratic consolidation and a source of tension and conflict. Why is this the case? Let me quickly list some of the recurrent challenges and complexities associated with elections in our sub-region. One, voters registration list and civil registries. In a number of countries, it remains difficult to confirm the accuracy of these lists, including the status of citizens registered. The same goes for civil registration systems, both manual and electronic. Two, the composition of electoral management bodies. Gaining stakeholders' confidence in the impartiality of the members of these bodies remains a continuous subject of conflict. Three, independence of the judiciary. Some concerns as regards election management, the same concern arises as regards election management bodies. In recent years, we've also noted a trend of judiciary being manipulated or instrumentalized for political objectives or to secure and ensure impunity for crimes charged, thereby undermining respect for the rule of law. On this issue, I would like to commend the exemplary path chosen by the Gambia, where the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission has been carrying out hearings in a credible manner that should contribute to transitional justice and social cohesion. Four, human rights and respect for rule of law. The protection of human rights and respect for the rule of law are other essential pillars of democracy. Yet, many countries in the region struggle with human rights challenges and impunity, violent crimes during electoral processes. Peaceful 
Five, peaceful transfer of power. In the past 30 years, the African continent has witnessed transfers of presidential power in the following countries. Benin, Kaverd, Madagascar, Mali, Niger, Malawi, Sao Tome, and Principe, and Zambia. Also, since 2000, the Comoros, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Guinea-Bissau, Kenya, Senegal, Seychelles, and Sierra Leone. More recent examples include the Gambia, Liberia, and Nigeria. In Africa and elsewhere, peaceful transfers of power operate under the dynamics of specific conditions, including the creation of strong opposition alliances to even the most entrenched long-serving regimes. For instance, opposition alliances largely paved the way for victories in Kenya in 2002, in Nigeria in 2015, the Gambia in 2016, and more recently in Malawi this year. It is also worthy of note that economic decline preceded the defeat of ruling parties in Nigeria and in the Gambia, indeed also in Liberia. On average, opposition parties win just 13% of elections when they do not form coalitions, but 46% of elections when they do build electoral alliances. This situation is obviously different from those where the existence of well-established and broad-based opposition parties has summarized political contests as an endeavor between two main contenders, contestants. Six, citizens' concerns amplified during electoral processes. Basic social services, employment, public safety, public accountability, infrastructure, access to social services, including health and education, and the enforcement of law and order have also played significant part. With regard to gender and elections, let me add that there have been slight increase, there has indeed been slight increase in the number of female members of governments in the region. Last year, we saw the first ever appointment of a female speaker of parliament in Togo. And this year, Togo also nominated its first female prime minister, a former UNDP staff, Madame Victoria Dobe Tomegan. This year, Senegal appointed its first woman foreign minister, Ms. Aishata Tal Saab, continuing the best practice following the nomination of its second woman prime minister, Ms. Aminata Toure, a few years ago. Of course, in Ghana, we're having successively two female foreign ministers in the previous government and in the current administration. Yet, women's representation remains a matter of concern that must be addressed as a priority. Laws, mechanisms, and strategies have been adopted in many countries in the region to protect women and girls and promote their participation in conflict prevention, political and peace processes, including parity laws in Verde, Guinea, and Senegal, quota laws in Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Sierra Leone, and parity principle and affirmative measures in electoral codes in Togo. Regarding the way forward, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
the journey of democratic consolidation in West Africa has not been easy and should not be taken for granted. Democratic consolidation is a dynamic process, not a linear one. It is about divergent arguments and beliefs. Contestations are part of this process. Sometimes these contestations turn antagonistic. Sometimes, unfortunately, they even turn violent. While rationally, there is no direct relationship between the concept of terrorism, regional insecurity, and elections, it should be noted that the volatile security environment in the region leads part of the population to feeling increasingly disconnected from government and the state. The recent events in Mali should serve as an important reminder that while elections are vital for the structuration of the political sphere, they are not sufficient to entrench the legitimacy of institutions born out of the polls. Elections remain a cornerstone of democratic consolidation in West Africa, but Mali indicates that weak or oppressive institutions create fertile grounds for the emergence, the augmentation, or the importation of anti-democratic movements. In some places, communities can be so fearful of their own security services, authors of gross human rights violations, that they may feel safer in the proximity of non-state actors, including armed groups. When democratization is not accompanied by socioeconomic progress, larger segments of the national communities lose faith in the prospects of ever benefiting individually from the dividends of democracy and would eventually be more receptive to sirens offering them immediate alleviation to their daily sorrows. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this is a crossroads at which violence, insecurity, and elections converge, thus forming a dangerous nexus and a significant hindrance to democratic consolidation. It is a collective responsibility for all national administrations, international community, civil society groups, women and youth organizations, traditional and religious leaders, policymakers and researchers to join hands to reverse the crisis of confidence in democratic institutions. This should start with an honest assessment of the drivers that have caused this gradual loss of trust and the diminished ranking that the Mo Ibrahim Index talks about. There is no doubt in my mind that the aspirations for democracy remains vivid across our sub-region and indeed Africa. This is consistently demonstrated through enthusiastic participation in voting operations, sometimes amidst challenging social and security circumstances, as has just been demonstrated in Burkina Faso this past week. Again, it is a responsibility of every one of us to maintain and to keep the flame alive. Let us demonstrate once again in Ghana on 7 December, our capacity to deliver credible, peaceful, nonviolent elections as we take additional steps forward 
in consolidating democracy in our country and in giving or remaining a good example in West Africa and across our continent. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambas, our eminent guest speaker for today. Let me remind you that um, this program is organized by the Center for African Legal Studies of the UPSA Law School, and we are eternally grateful to our eminent personality today for grazing the occasion and speaking on the hydra-headed issue of terror, insecurity in Africa, and elections. Now, as the program rolled on, some of you have sent in some few questions. We shall be reading them out to our um, eminent speaker so that he can interact with us. Uh, but in the meantime, I would um, go ahead with one or two questions to our um, eminent uh, you know, speaker. Uh, now, Your Excellency, the, the issue about presidential term limits in Africa has been raging on for some time now. Um, the recent example in Cote d'Ivoire, um, even though they went through you know, processes to have the presidential term limit change to give you know, President Ouattara another term, um, led to the political situation we see in Cote d'Ivoire now with its attendant uh, security problems. How does the AU, the African Union, together with organizations like the United Nations, hope? to work with African leaders to beyond this point, respect term limits and ensure that we don't see a recurrent, uh, you know, changes of term limit in Africa as we have seen recently with the, you know, Cote d'Ivoire example, Your Excellency. Yes, the issue of term limits um, is one that is left to the constitutional dispensation of each country. And therefore, at this point, the African Union um, does not have a standard uh, template on term limitation. What we have seen though, has been a trend in West Africa where countries have deemed it in their own national interest to have term limits. And moving from an era where there were no term limits, we have seen progressively that across West Africa, it has more or less emerged as the norm. In fact, uh, until the current wave of uh, elections, uh, or let me just say by, two, by, by 2019, 2019, in, in our region, there were only two countries that did not have term limitations in their constitutions. These were Togo and the Gambia. However, these two countries also moved in the direction with conforming with the rest of the countries in the region by initiating constitutional processes to 
create or establish term limitation so that uh, today, indeed, in Togo, term limitation has been adopted in the constitution of Togo and in the Gambia, which is in the process of adopting a new constitution post President Jame. The Constitutional Review Commission has proposed the re-establishment of term limits in the constitution of the Gambia. Re-establishment because I should point out that in the original constitution um, adopted um, in the Gambia, uh, under which President Jami was elected, the original constitution had term limits it was President Jami who subsequently removed term limits. So it's a matter of reinstating it in the Gambia, and that's the trend. Now, were that to happen, which I feel very optimistic would be the case, then by practice, all of West Africa indeed would have uh, term limits in their constitutions. For West Africans, we have deemed that as useful, as very helpful, as something that helps to create stability and to avoid uh, the kind of contentious uh, situations that we have witnessed, for example, lately in Guinea and in Cote d'Ivoire. Now, it's interesting that even in both cases, although the current presidents have been elected, uh, to run and for their third terms, that the provisions on term limitations were not removed. What has happened is that there were new constitutions adopted, which were then presented to the population at referenda, and hence creating new republics. And this is uh, the condition under which in the two countries, the current presidents have been able to contest the elections. But term limitations have been maintained in their uh, constitutions. And this is where uh, some have argued that West Africa through ECOWAS can formalize this good practice, which in virtually all our countries we have come to accept. Precisely because it has been demonstrated time again that when there have not been term, term limits, the agitation for it and the agitation to limit the mandates of long serving heads of states have sometimes uh, plunged the countries into conflict. Um, so I think that will be the manner in which things will progress rather than an African Union level um, uh, model that will be adopted and imposed on all. I believe, for instance, that if in West Africa we have this practice which is working for, well for us and it helps to reduce conflicts in West Africa. Indeed, Southern Africa is also one of the regions where term limits are respected. And so in time, if it becomes demonstrable that term limits help in stabilizing countries uh, and in preventing conflict, then we may move to that stage where uh, more and more African countries will adopt term limits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, I'm only going to allow one follow-up question on to this one because the presidential term limits issue appears to be a very motive one in Africa. So, you know, kindly permit me to uh, ask a follow-up question from uh, Andara. Um, he says that with reference to Cote d'Ivoire, is there ever a scenario where a sitting president extending their term limit is justified? Your Excellency. Well, as I have explained, I mean, um, if you uh, take the Cote d'Ivoire example, it was pursuant to a new constitution which was adopted and which 
uh, then created uh, a new republic, and uh, which, uh, if one is to uh, apply the principle of non-retroactivity of laws, uh, the current president uh, then uh, uh, argued that, of course, the new constitution is moving forward, is prospective, and therefore the, ter the two term limit contained in that constitution was applicable from uh, this year's uh, elections. Um, it is an issue that was taken to the constitutional court of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, which ruled that indeed uh, laws are uh, not retroactive and therefore argued that the president uh, was eligible. Uh, in this regard, one recalls that in Senegal, during the term of President Abdullah Wad, a similar scenario was presented where President Wad, in his last uh, of the second term, then caused the uh, constitution to be amended, uh, amended and was presented at the referendum and passed. And then he uh, uh, presented himself as a candidate. Of course, the political class uh, opposed, uh, civil society and others uh, opposed this move very, very uh, actively. Uh, but the constitutional court, again, in the case of Senegal, also argued that he was eligible to, to contest. So I think the issue there is to uh, hope that this kind of what some will call a manipulation of constitution that is not repeated time again, because we've seen that the effect of it is usually to plunge countries into crisis uh, with the resulting loss of human lives. I mean, in the case of Cote d'Ivoire, um, 80 lives were lost in this electoral cycle. Uh, is preventable. In the case of Guinea, almost 180 uh, persons died out of uh, agitation around uh, this issue of uh, third term mandate. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now to the next question. Um, it is interesting um, when you mentioned uh, that the the, the, the African leadership need to adopt long-term strategies for sustainable job creation as a way of, uh, you know, keeping uh, the youth focused and, you know, de thereby um, reducing their vulnerability to joining terrorist groups in Africa. Um, Your Excellency, how do you respond to growing youth despondency in the existing political arrangement, blaming it on ballooning bureaucracy, which doesn't respond to the growing needs of the youth. We saw the recent um, you know, clashes in Nigeria. Um, it's underlining you know, causes widely known, but you know, the, the unemployment issues uh, were manifested during that um, you know, protest which turned violent. How does the African Union, um, the UN, and all the international organizations, how should African leaders ensure that the youth begin to see the fruit of political leadership? Well, I mean, from your question, you can see that um, it is one that requires broad partnerships and acting on several fronts. Um, but the first uh, important uh, starting point uh, is to acknowledge that we do indeed have a problem of a youth bulge on the continent um, and uh, to seek to address it. I mean, a youth bulge in the sense that uh, uh, we have growing uh, population of young people, um, and it, it can it can actually be an advantage. It should be uh, an advantage because that means a very youthful, dynamic, agile, healthy uh, population. If um, we work to create that environment, which allows the full potential of this youth 
to be to be harnessed, to be tapped, and to be used for constructive purpose of uh, national uh, development. Uh, but that that in, involves, as I said, um, ensuring that educational opportunities are there for them, um, not just in in terms of uh, uh, quantity and numbers, but also the kind of relevant uh, training that will make people uh, be able in a, in a, in a world dominated by information uh, technology uh, to to acquire all the, the, the necessary skills uh, to be able to 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 be useful and productive members of of, of society. Um, from the UN perspective. Uh, we have indeed, uh, within the context of the sustainable development goals, placed a lot of emphasis on the need to work with, especially youth and women. Uh, they constitute the bulk of the population, and we think that uh, states um, should work uh, hand in hand with UN and other partners through their national uh, development strategies and plans to ensure that there's sufficient focus on these segments of the population, uh, which could be very transformative if their full potentialities are developed. And um, a host of reforms are often required, reforms that will ensure that uh, African resources are uh, properly harnessed, um, transformed. We've often talked about uh, moving away from just exporting raw materials. Um, economies that just export raw materials cannot create that many jobs. That is our challenge. So what are we going to do to move into uh, processing? What are we going to do to create an environment to ensure that the, uh, the, the, the private sector grows? Uh, not just uh, foreign private sector, domestic private sector. And along with it, of course, um, other uh, private sector are welcome to also contribute. Uh, what are we going to do in terms of building stronger state institutions that will be able to, to deliver and uh, be more efficient, effective in creating, enabling environment for uh, other uh, sectors to be able to, 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 to play their role. So it's a whole set of discussions around these issues. For us, the framework that the United Nations has is through the Sustainable Development Goals, which, which says that let's make fighting poverty a priority. Let's try to focus on harnessing women and youth potentialities. Uh, let's make sure that we create opportunities and leave no one behind. And let's integrate all these uh, goals that we have uh, within national development uh, programs, which we hope will be realistic and will be well-funded and uh, will be programs that uh, also will ensure that there's uh, as little diversion of these resources you know, into public hands. That means the fight against corruption is also very, very uh, important in uh, this endeavor that um, is, is fr frankly quite urgent and is, is required to be taken up uh, seriously because if we don't, then uh, what we saw in Nigeria, unfortunately, may happen. And then what will happen there, as we saw again in Nigeria, is that very legitimate causes can be hijacked by all kinds of elements, including some that are just how to, to create uh, uh, chaos and uh, disorder. And that cannot be in the, in the interest of any uh, African state or the continent as a whole. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, we have a question from Adams Azemeti, um, who um, wishes to know that um, in his candid opinion, he thinks that Terrorism is widespread in Africa because most African regimes promote it to serve their narrow interests of staying in power. 
And Your Excellency, this may sound, you know, conspiratorial, but it, it's a conspiracy theory on the street that the terrorism is widespread in Africa. It is gaining root in the Sahel. It is what you know spreading wide across West Africa because regimes that are supposed to be protecting citizens are themselves perpetrating this terror as a strategy to remain in power. And this is a question we have from Adams um, Azameti. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think there is any evidence uh, to support uh, this uh, theory, and I, I, it's not one that should be uh, encouraged. I mean, uh, from across the Sahel, for instance, from Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, northeast of uh, Nigeria. You have governments there that are very determined to fight terrorism. They are, they've mobilized their, their countries and uh, resources, which they have put to this. Uh, they've, in fact, formed joint multinational forces to combat terrorism with support of UN and other partners. Um, it is a, it's a serious challenging problem that they face and has, it's nothing to do with uh, these countries uh, creating these uh, movements. We know that these uh, uh, organizations without any clear uh, set of ideology, um, they're very misguided and they're, 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 they're causing uh, tremendous uh, mayhem, killings, and destruction in these countries against government targets, security forces, and of course civilian population. And um, as I've said, I mean the 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 causes of it uh, are, are there, and more and more we have to acknowledge them and begin to deal with them. Um, it's not just the military aspect that should be tackled, but also root causes. I mean, neglect, uh, marginalization. You, when you have uh, uh, large populations uh, which don't have opportunities for education, for help, uh, no social infrastructure, uh, then you, you, you leave them vulnerable to terrorist groups. So uh, fighting terrorism involves, yes, the military uh, kinetic efforts that are being made, but at the same time, it has to be a comprehensive approach that seeks now to bring government to the people, bring uh, services, uh, social, uh, economic infrastructure should be created there and uh, opportunities for education, for health, um, and other opportunities so that um, uh, the populations in these areas can feel a part of the countries in which uh, they belong. Thank you, Your Excellency. We have another question from Irene. She's a student of the UPSA. Um, she's concerned about political violence, violence in elections, and she wished to know how um, we can use social media, how social media is being used now to perpetrate and further advance, you know, violent um, narratives, uh, violent rhetorics. How can we use the same tool of social media uh, to re-engineer um, our youth in Africa uh, to solve the growing violence in politics as a phenomenon in our continent? Yeah, social media is a double-edged sword. I mean, its benefits are obvious. And um, uh, in a society uh, where um, it has become uh, an inevitable tool, uh, one can use it for, for many goods. I mean, for instance, if we take this period of uh, um, COVID and lockdowns, uh, where, if, uh, in fact, many people have been forced to stay at home, including students. Um, you know, the new technologies have facilitated working from home. The new facilitators have facilitated education, uh, long distance, um, in, and through online education, etc. On the other hand, we also know that uh, 
it can be used and has been used negatively. So it is a, a challenge again, uh, and all of society uh, approach is required to take on this challenge that we all have a responsibility uh, to uh, make sure that um, perhaps the few who manipulate and use social media wrongly with hate speech and incitement to violence, that um, they are able to be isolated, identified, and discouraged from this uh, conduct. I am, for instance, attending now in Kumasi uh, a forum, an all stakeholders forum on holding of peaceful elections on December 7th. And uh, we're very happy to have with us the president of the Ghana Journalist uh, Association, uh, Dr. Uh, Afil uh, Moni. Uh, and he talked on this issue of social media and what the organized journalist association are doing in their own small way through media to educate people to eschew uh, use of social media for negative propaganda and for uh, uh, divisive uh, uh, purposes and uh, inciting violence, et cetera. So I think all of us have to share in, 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 in the burden in, in tackling this issue. Let's accentuate the positive aspect of uh, social media and let's shun the negative aspect and let us work through institutions, um, including, of course, uh, regulatory institutions, etc., to see what we can do to minimize the negative impact of social media. Thank you, Your Excellency. And maybe our final question for for today: What would be your message to the teeming African youth who are largely unemployed and maybe feeling despondent? Um, what would be your message to them? about political leadership and the need to, to, to trust the system and have hope. Why should they keep hoping, Your Excellency? Well, I mean, if, if they give up hope and they refuse to engage, then for sure they, they are condemning themselves and their societies uh, to further uh, deterioration. Uh, on the other hand, if they have a positive attitude, which I urge all of them to do, and take up a personal responsibility to be informed citizens, to be agents of change, and uh, to be active in advocating for the right kind of change that they want to see, and not only advocating, but indeed uh, preparing themselves adequately to bring about that change, then I think we will see the change that we all are yearning for on our continent. You know, we have young people who have, uh, through generations, always demonstrated the ability to, to turn things around. Don't forget that the independent generation, which brought about independence to our continent, uh, faced many hurdles. But they were mostly young people. If you go back and you check, they were in their 20s and 30s, and they were able to overcome colonialism and bring about uh, uh, independent Africa. Today's generation is even better prepared, more educated, has access to technology, they're more savvy. So indeed, um, uh, they do have a lot to contribute, and we're already seeing it. Um, in spite of the challenges, there's so many young, um, dynamic Africans who are, you know, establishing startups and you know their own enterprises and uh, bringing about innovation, you know, and uh, so that potential is uh, something that is very hopeful for Africa's future. And I think uh, together with governments, because governments have a key role also to play together with government, civil society, private sector, all of us uh, pooling together, I think we can create that better future for African youth, youth that they are so much yearning for. But uh, we look up to this youth 
Uh, we have a lot of hope in them and uh, they should not give up at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambers. Um, he is the Special Representative of the United Nations General Secretary General for West Africa and the Sahel. Thank you very much for uh, honoring our invitation and spending time with us this afternoon. At this point, I will be calling upon the Dean of the UPSA Law School, Mr. Ernest Kofi Abochi, to uh, give us his closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Audrey. Not much to say, except to say that I picked three things, three key things from our eminent speaker's lecture. The first, I'm sorry, let me put my video on. Yes. The first is that we need to have concrete outcomes of our democratic gains for the youthful population that we have to have a feel of this, i.e. democracy must mean something. And the dividends of democracy must begin to be felt by the young people of our countries on the continent. So it's imperative that we don't just say people can vote, but people must begin to see the practical social goods that are delivered by way of democracy. The second is that our countries on the continent are largely comprised of youthful people. So our population are, is largely youthful. The World Bank has, and, I mean, has certified this. And the reality is that the fastest growing economies are also on the continent. However, tiding with the first one, as the speaker indicated, we need to ensure that people have a feel of this. It must be practical. It must not just be being a democratic oasis on the continent. We must begin to feel this. People must feel this in their pockets, in their health, in their education. People must feel this in the various dynamics of social living. And the third point that I picked from the speaker's lecture is that there's a direct connection between terrorism and hope. In other words, if the youthful people of this country and the continent do not feel a sense of hope, i.e. that there's a tomorrow which is better than the past. And connecting to the last statement he just made, that the independent, the independent population of, of, of the days gone by did not even have the opportunities that we have today. If the young people can't feel a sense of hope, and the first point of call is the embassies of Western countries, and wanting to emigrate and leave our country and, and see hope in other places other than this place, then not only are they liable or amenable to being exploited by political opportunists for violence and other um, unacceptable ends, but also they will not invest in our countries because there's nothing here. And so I think with these three things that I've picked up, I'm sure everyone has picked up something or multiple things. I am better benefited and I would like to just thank on my own behalf and on behalf of the Vice Chancellor of the UPSA, I would like to thank the eminent speaker for today, Dr. Ebin Chambers, first of all, for opening the eminent lecture, uh, eminent guest lecture series. It is not easy to be the first to start anything, so we appreciate him for this. And he certainly will be remembered historically to have been the first to have spoken on this platform. We are very much honored to have had you and to have shared your perspectives, which I find very enriching indeed. So thank you very much, and I do hope that the policymakers and all those who are the livers of change and have power in our countries will be listening to you and um, will apply some of the advice and perspectives that you shared with us today. I thank you all for coming. This is not a vote of thanks, I'm sure, but it's my own thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dean, um, Mr. Kofi Abochi, for, for these closing remarks. Um, I, I certainly uh, think that it passes for uh, a vote of thanks um, to our eminent guest speaker and to all our uh, listeners across the globe who are listening to us and across the sub-region. We have been live on Joy FM 99.7, and we have been also on Facebook. Um, and you, you have been wonderful with all your questions. Unfortunately, time has not been on our side. Uh, we have not been able to read out all your questions. Uh, hopefully, we can have our eminent you know, speaker look at the questions 
And then at the appropriate time, he could send you know, responses to us. We could forward them to you um, in due course. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, you know, for coming. Uh, you know, thank you, VC. Thank you, Dean. Thank you all for making time. See you again next time. Goodbye. So that has been the eminent guest lecture series there. You just had Yaro Kasambata, who happens to be the MC for the occasion. Of course, it's an online program. It's been more like a webinar. You had uh, Dr. Ibn Chambas there, who is the special representative of the UN Secretary General, also heads um, the Sahel region. Well, he talked about a lot. And I'll just leave you with the uh, way forward, as uh, Dr. Ibn Chambas um, puts it together. He talked first of all about elections across the uh, West African um, sub-region. He also talked about the way forward, which is, says there have been contestations, of course, in the process of our, uh, the country's um, democratic development, but says it has brought about, you know, some a little bit of an antagonistic situations sometimes that have turned um, violent. He talked about the volatile security situation, but like you heard uh, the dean of the uh, faculty of law say it is more like a link between terrorism and hope i won't bore you with most of uh, a lot of the talk this will be available on youtube uh, join us youtube you can always reach out for it